Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started here. So good morning, everyone. It, um, I want to welcome you to uh, Friday morning um, Thyroid uh, Journal Club. Um, it's really a pleasure to introduce Dr. Michael Villa, who is Associate Professor of Medicine at Icon School of Medicine. He is also Fellowship Program Director in Endocrinology and Metabolism. And um, Michael will be presenting um, our, the article for this morning. And it's a real pleasure to have Dr. Terry Davies, who is the Florence and Theodore um, Bumritter Professor of Medicine at the Icon School of Medicine. He is Director of Endocrinology Division at uh, Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He is widely recognized um, for his expertise in the field and also a past president of the American Thyroid Association. So thank you both and welcome to everybody. Uh, Michael, thanks. All right, uh, great, thank you. Thanks, Mark, uh, and thanks for inviting us to, to present today. It's always a pleasure. I, I've been attending, of course, these conferences since their inception. It's a pleasure. You always get such wonderful speakers and topics, and I'm happy to be presenting today a review of a recently published article. And we'll start off with this case uh, that was provided. It's a, a case that maybe uh, you know resonates with many of us. Uh, let's just read through it, and then I think there's a way to vote uh, on what we would do clinically, and then we'll revisit this case at the end to see if anyone's changed their mind. Uh, so let's read through. It's a 36-year-old female singer. Uh, she presented to our thyroid center for a second opinion on a single incidentally found thyroid nodule in the left lobe. The nodule was solid, hypoechoic, wider than tall, measuring 18 millimeters in its largest dimension with smooth, smooth margins and no microcalcifications. The patient was asymptomatic, had no family history or radiation exposure. No suspicious lymph nodes were observed in the neck, and the patient underwent ultrasound-guided fine needle aspiration biopsy, uh, which was reported as Bethesda-4 lesion. Molecular markers were sent and were positive for NRAS mutation. Uh, they were negative for any other mutations, including for BRAF V600E mutation. And so based on the above results, what would your first choice be in her treatment? And here's the choice is active surveillance, lobectomy with potential uh, you know, revisit, uh, revisitation for uh, any other high-risk features that may be uh, seen at the time of surgery. Uh, total thyroidectomy with central neck uh, and lymph node dissection. Uh, total thyroidectomy with central neck dissection and remnant ablation. Those are the four choices. And I think here the poll is open, so if our, our attendees would like to vote. Okay, here's the poll results. Looks like they're being shared. I don't see them, but um, well, anyway, uh, great. So I'll just get started. This is the article I'm reviewing today. It was recently published in the journal Thyroid in April of 2020, uh, the utilities of RAS mutations uh, in the preoperative fine needle biopsies for decision-making. And it's uh, this is out of the group out of Boston. It's really nice to see Dr. Braverman's name in print. And I think the rest of the group uh, uh, led by Stephanie Lee, uh, did a wonderful job in carry on, carrying on his legacy. Uh, and so I'll be reviewing this article today, looking at RAS mutation in fine needle biopsies. We'll start with what we know. We know there's a lot of thyroid nodules. We've seen this slide many times. Uh, we know there's a lot of thyroid cancer. Uh, this maybe we don't recognize, but each this is just a summary of the various autopsy studies, people who die for other reasons. And if you do a whole thyroid exam, uh, this is the percent uh, of thyroid cancer prevalence, roughly around, if you average out each individual study, around 11% or so, 12%. High risk of thyroid cancer if you just look for it in the population, and they've done this in South Korea. If you look for it, you'll find a high rate of thyroid cancer. But we know many of these cancers are not so clinically significant, though some of them are. So when we're faced with a thyroid nodule, uh, we really, all of us, and try to answer these questions. One, is it cancer? And two, if so, how will this cancer act? Uh, we've come up with many schemes in trying to help guide us. Of course, these are from the, the guidelines now five years ago uh, that we recognize the importance of ultrasound appearance. If we see something that looks like these, of course, a high risk of cancer. Uh, these are not that common. Uh, these are common. If we see something like these, so low risk of cancer. We know that, uh, not really that relevant for today because these nodules wouldn't be biopsied. Most nodules actually look look somewhere in the middle here. They're either intermediate or low suspicion. And these are the ones that we're all trying to make decisions on. 
uh, based on ultrasound appearance. We also, of course, have cytology we've had for a while uh, with various categories. Uh, it's great if it's benign. It's great if it's malignant, at least that's clear what to do, but many times we have biopsies somewhere in between and we have to make a clinical decision. Uh, in the last five to 10 years, uh, many of us have been using molecular markers and these, these potential studies have improved as to which genes we can screen for and which type of mo uh, molecules we can screen for. Um, if you go to the latest version of the DNA analysis, uh, the, this is the ThyroSeq version three panel uh, put out by CBL Path. Uh, there are 112 genes uh, and various other uh, uh, fusions and deletions that can be detected uh, by this next-gen DNA sequencing. Um, or if you go by one of the comp uh, competing panels, they have a smaller amount of DNA tests, but they also include microscopic RNA, which is an important signal molecule, and the signature of the microscopic RNA uh, in thyroid cancer cells, or for that matter, any cancer cell, uh, different than regular thyroid tissue. And so these, these markers of microRNA are positive in thyroid cancer. But they don't tell us at least as much, perhaps, or maybe they do, uh, as some of these genes. If you look at the genes that are studied, um, a lot of them, you know, aside from these thyroid-specific genes like the TSH receptor or PTH, in case there happens to be an intrathyroidal parathyroid gland, a lot of these genes are oncogenes or they're tumor suppressor genes that when mutated lead to cancer, or in this case, lead to thyroid cancer. And the two main pathways that are that do lead to thyroid cancer, we think, uh, one is the MAP kinase pathway, which has been known now for a while. I remember studying this in college. Um, and it, just to go over very quickly, growth factors, uh, external growth factors bind to their receptors, which then becomes phosphorylated at various uh, tyrosine residues. Uh, this then uh, uh, sequesters various proteins and activates, eventually activating RAS, which then phosphorylates BRAF, kind of a cascading event amplifying the signal, all the way down to ERK, which then trans, uh, transfers into the nucleus and activates various nuclear factors. This governs cell growth and differentiation and function. When this pathway is activated, cells grow and the function of the cells is suppressed a bit. So you can, if you measure, for example, sodium iodine symporter expression and activity, it's much less when this pathway is activated. Um, and same thing with iodine coupling and integration into thyroid uh, hormone. Um, and so what we like to see in endocrinology, of course, is that there's a, a shutoff mechanism. There's a negative feedback. Uh, this ERK molecule, when it's activated, it serves to negatively feedback against BRAF, as well as to the cell protein, uh, the cell surface receptor that activates the whole thing. So we start to get ready to shut off this pathway when it's not needed. So that's the MAP kinase pathway. The other important pathway is the PI3 kinase pathway. Uh, this is an interesting pathway because it also regulates cell growth and differentiation and function. And it's governed, interestingly, by insulin, also IGF-1. Uh, and there's a lot of nice work, uh, especially by Lewis Cantley at Cornell and by Ben Hopkins at Mount Sinai, uh, where uh, they're studying you know, metabolic ways to treat cancer. This pathway, uh, both of these pathways are important in many types of cancer. And you know, if you could lower insulin levels, you could lower activation of the PI3 cat pathway. So treating with very low carbohydrate diets, ketogenic diets uh, has been shown in you know, other treatment refractory cancers to have some benefit, uh, but that's a little bit on the side. The point is that these various molecules that you see listed here are part of the are part of the gene screening panels that we help help us to determine if a thyroid nodule is actually malignant or not. And the second point is that RAS is involved in this pathway here, the PI3 kinase pathway, whereas BRAF or RAF is not. Uh, so there's a difference. Uh, here's a nice study looking at nearly 500 papillary thyroid cancers uh, and they looked they did whole genome sequencing both of the cancer of the primary lesion as well as of the unaffected thyroid tissue and so they're able to compare and see which genes have been mutated in formation of that cancer and of these 500 most were classic some were follicular variants there's a few tall cell and some other uncommon variants and i know it's a busy slide uh, if you haven't seen these, each vertical line represents an individual case. So there's 500, 496 vertical lines going across. And the whole point I just want to show you is here they list the point mutations that were found. And by far and away, this 60% of point mutations was a BRAF mutation. In papillary thyroid cancer, BRAF is the most common. 
Um, the next most common is NRAS, which you know is right here about 8%, and then HRAS, and then KRAS is a little bit further down the line. The three isoforms of RAS make up the next most common type of mutation. Uh, and then there's a smattering of other mutations and fusion mutations, and then this here just shows a chromosome uh, copy number increases and decreases that may also be seen. Uh, what I thought was also interesting is that here, if you look at histologic type, uh, the blue is classic papillary, and so most of these BRAF mutations are classic papillary, whereas if you look at the RAS mutations, the purple is follicular variant. Uh, so most of those are follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, though you see a little bit of blue in here. So there's a few cases of classic. Um, so that's that very large study uh, of just screening, just uh, case series of thyroid cancer patients. Um, the, this study did not include any follicular thyroid cancers. There is not a corresponding cancer, uh, study that's quite as large looking at follicular cancers, but here's a much smaller one doing the same kind of analysis, looking at 13 follicular adenomas and 12 follicular carcinomas. Again, looking at the genes, and in this study, you can see there was only one BRAF in uh, the follicular carcinoma, the majority of genes were NRAS or HRAS in follicular carcinomas. And even follicular adenomas, we see a lot of RAS mutations. Of course, other mutations as well were seen in these types of, of, of lesions. Um, and here's just one more study, just to give us the idea again and confirm what was seen. 180 now thyroid tumors of, of various kinds, uh, including 25 follicular adenomas, so not cancer for those, uh, 30 follicular carcinomas, 48 follicular variant papillary thyroid cancers, and 77 classic papillary thyroid cancer. Here it is broken down by histologic subtype. So here's all the, all the uh, classic papillary thyroid cancer. And again, the number one gene that's seen in about two thirds of cases is BRAF. This one, not quite as many RAS mutations, only, only a few um, uh, were seen. In uh, the follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, which is this category here, um, you can see that there still is some BRAF, but there's also a series of, of RAS mutations that were seen um, in the follicular variant thyroid cancer. And this was, if you can see, the, the date of the study was in 2016 before the definition of NIFTP, but they did break it down as encapsulated follicular variant which we now know as NIFTP. And so if you look at the NIFTPs, there's still a little bit of BRAF mutation, but the majority of them have RAS mutations. And then here now looking at follicular cancer, um, there were no BRAF mutations. It was all RAS and various other genes that were mutated. Uh, and then lastly, at follicular adenomas, a few RAS mutations and then other mutations were seen. So just to get the idea that a BRAF mutation usually confers papillary thyroid cancer, although it can uh, vary somewhat, uh, a RAS mutation is usually seen in patients who have either follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer or in follicular thyroid cancer or in a follicular adenoma, although there are exceptions in both cases. Um, so just to review once more time, so the, the MAP kinase pathway we see when there's a constitutionally active BRAF, of course this pathway is constitutionally active and whatever is happening upstream from it is not really important. So when you have this negative feedback here from PIRC, well this is kind of a moot point, it's not necessary. Uh, and so uh, obviously this leads to, you know, constitutionally uh, changes in gene expression within these cells uh, in, who have a, a BRAF V600E mutation, um, loss of negative feedback there. Whereas if you have a RAS mutation, well, sure, the same meta, uh, uh, MAP kinase pathway is activated, but you still have this negative feedback here. So you can see uh, that perhaps this pathway is not quite as active. Um, and there may be some differences in biology of the cancer as a result of these differences uh, between the position and the pathway of RAS and RAF. And of course, the second difference is that the PI3 kinase pathway can be affected or is affected in mutant RAS, where it's not affected in mutant BRAF. So leading to different biology, not surprising that we see differences uh, um, you know, on the higher level looking at uh, the pathology of, uh, and pathophysiology of the different cancers that come from these mutations. Uh, it's been recognized for a while that mutation can guide prognosis. Uh, this study came out in 2014. Uh, it's kind of the culmination of, of probably 20 or 30 years looking at various mutations and how do they predict outcome. This study only looked at BRAF, TERT-T, 
and then the combination of BRAF and TERT mutations. And you can see if neither mutation was present, recurrence-free survival was relatively small. If one of the mutations it was kind of in, uh, was present, it was intermediate. And then, of course, if both were present, then recurrence-free survival was rather low. Uh, so that, along with many other studies or several other studies, uh, you know, made it to the guidelines, the last guidelines that we've seen, showing that many genes, or at least genes, should be part of our decision-making process. Uh, now, they only included a few genes in this, uh, but as we now have uh, many, many, you know, much information from, from the various uh, uh, next-gen testing uh, on thyroid nodules, we now have a lot more information as to what genes are present in each nodule, and maybe that will help guide the management and help predict the future uh, or, or of what's happening in thyroid cancer. But as we know, it's really hard to make predictions, um, including about thyroid cancer. Thanks, Yogi. Um, what can we learn about thyroid nodules that have a RAS mutation? That's the point of this study. So this is the study uh, that we're reviewing today, the utility of RAS mutations in decision-making after fine needle biopsy. Here's what they did. They enrolled all patients who came to Boston Medical Center uh, in this th almost three-year period uh, uh, and anyone with a thyroid nodule greater than one centimeter. They performed FNA biopsy, and they do a pretty uh, thorough job, four to six passes on of the needle. Uh, they followed ATA guidelines, and of course, during the study, there was the new guidelines that came out, but that shouldn't really affect much. I mean, the, the change in guidelines from 2009 to 2015 was mainly focusing on uh, raising the cutoff for many of the benign appearing uh, thyroid nodules, the spongiform nodules, et cetera, uh, shouldn't really affect the outcomes of this study where we're looking at more of the inter intermediate or, uh, or malignant looking nodules. Uh, all the cytology was done locally at Boston Medical Center, but if they had Bethesda 3, 4, or 5, uh, it was sent for mutational analysis. And in addition, uh, there were cases, all the Bethesda 1s that were found, uh, several Bethesda 2s, and even a handful of Bethesda 6 cases uh, that was requested by the performing physician uh, were sent for mutational analysis. So that adds a little bit of, of bias and skew to this, um, but uh, as, as you see, this is kind of a real-world situation where some of us may choose in certain instances to find out the molecular characterization of nodules with these kind of cytology. Uh, they sent for ThyroSeq, uh, which is, again, uh, put out by CBL Path. Uh, uh, they use ThyroSeq mostly version 2, a little bit of version 3. I'll go through the numbers in a minute. Um, in addition to that, they re-evaluated all the images and scored them by the TIRADS scoring system. Uh, and then, of course, if they were non-cancerous nodules, they did the usual thing, enrolled them in an observational uh, surveillance kind of uh, pattern, uh, as we often do. Uh, if there was a very large nodule or if there was patient preference, surgery was considered, but that's you know, outside of the study to, to most extent. Most benign nodules were not operated on. Um, because there are many genes, they group the genes into various categories uh, that kind of make sense. Oh, sorry. Um, there's the RAS only group, which includes the three isoforms of RAS, H, N, and K RAS. There's the RAS like group that includes the RAS isoforms in addition to these other genes. This K601E mutation of BRAF that is, behaves a lot like RAS, uh, and this fusion gene that may, apparently behaves a lot like RAS. There's the BRAF V600E-like group, which includes BRAF V600E or a red PTC fusion. There's the low risk group, which includes these mutations that usually confer very low risk of thyroid cancer. There's the combined high risk group, which includes TERT-T plus some other mutation, either a RAS-like or a BRAF-like mutation. That's the high risk group, or the other group, just miscellaneous, uh, various other mutations that were found. So here are the numbers. Uh, they did 1,400 biopsies in this three year period. And of those, about 580 were either Bethesda 3405 and a smattering of 1, 2, and 6. Uh, they were sent them for thyroseq, mostly V2, 546 cases of version 2 only 34 cases of version three. So this entire paper is really an analysis of the ThyroSeq V2 program um, with a little bit of V3. They found that there were 34 duplicate specimens and there were 42 that had insufficient material for ThyroSeq analysis. And so in the end, they had 504 nodules for which they had mutational data. Um, 
here's the cytology of those 504 nodules. They had 87 Bethesda 1, and here's the percentage. Um, that seems like a very high percentage, especially for four to six passes. Uh, perhaps they have a very stringent cytologist up in Boston, I'm not sure. Uh, but so they have a, a pretty high rate of Bethesda 1. Um, Bethesda 2, they only sent a few, as, as one would expect. The majority of what was sent was Bethesda 3 and some Bethesda 4 a little bit of Bethesda 5, and then a few cases of Bethesda 6. So uh, we did run the gambit, but for the most part, we're talking about Bethesda 3 nodules that were sent for mutational analysis. So of those 504 that were sent for mutational analysis, 173 had at least one mutation. So 34% had at least one mutation. And of those mutations, 80 had a RAS mutation. There's 10 of the KRAS, 17 of the HRAS, and 53 of the NRAS, so 46% of mutations were RAS mutations, which is the, the most common, uh, uh, you know, by a, by a pretty long margin, the most common type of mutation in a thyroid nodule is a RAS mutation. And of these, seven of them had at least another mutation. One of the seven actually had three mutations that were detected. Uh, four of the second mutations were in the TERP-T, and then there was an EIF1AX, P10, and T53 mutations that were also uh, co mutations uh, seen at the same time as a RAS mutation. Of those 80, 56 had surgery. So 36 had total thyroidectomies and they were doing total thyroidectomies in everyone up until 2017. And after that, they decided to judiciously use lobectomy versus total thyroidectomy. So 38 total thyroidectomies, mostly of the cases were, were total. Uh, 18 lobectomies were performed in, out of the 56 who had surgery. And here is the lineup of all 80 cases of RAS mutations that were found out of this cohort. Again, there were 10 of the KRAS, that's the blue, uh, the orange HRAS 17, and 53 NRAS mutations. This is the locus of the, you know, the amino acid substitution that was seen. You can see the vast majority are this kind of light purple, uh, which corresponds to a Q61R mutation. So at position 61, there's an arginine now. And this apparently is a very uh, common mutation in RAS leading to cancer. It's uh, been shown in the literature to be commonly seen both in thyroid cancers and in other cancers that are associated with RAS mutations in other tissues. Uh, this is uh, an important regulatory site for the RAS and this mutation makes it constituently active. The second most common mutation, which is kind of rarely seen here, was the Q61K. So at the same position, but now a lysine instead of arginine. Um, also leading to constituently active RAS. And then there's a handful of these very other uh, mutations at the 12 position. These are the secondary mutations seen only in a few patients. So here's the four TERT mutations you can see here. And then here are the four others. And this one patient has two mutations plus the NRAS, so three. So that's why there's seven total patients who had more than one mutation that were detected in this study. And here's what they did, the clinical management, where did my mouse go? Here we go. Clinical management is in this column. Pink is surgery. And so most patients had surgery. Brown is active surveillance. Uh, some patients had active surveillance. And eight patients were lost to follow up, which is what this tan color is. So there's some interesting things that you can see just by looking at this slide. Uh, one is the decision of this person. Uh, this person has an NRAS mutation, uh, has a greater than four centimeter lesion with growth. Oh, sorry, that's cytology category. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, it's a two centimeter lesion, but with growth and Bethesda five um, and still opted for active surveillance. Uh, whereas many of these other patients had uh, Beth uh, you know, Bethesda three with just an NRAS mutation and opted for surgery. But this patient is still following by, by uh, active surveillance. Um, there's a few other things you see. One, uh, uh, well, I guess we should go through uh, the pathology before, before going further. Um, the pathology uh, in those who had surgery uh, or biological feature, which means growth or not. And uh, the pathology yellow means uh, benign. So most cases were benign. The next most common is follicular variant uh, papillary thyroid cancer, which are seen in this kind of lightish brown. Uh, NIFTP are seen in this beige color. There's a few cases over there. 
Uh, there's a case of medullary thyroid cancer, interesting. And there's a few cases of poorly differentiated thyroid cancer. Uh, one of the cases that's poorly differentiated is this case that has three mutations. So that may not be so surprising. But here's a case of poorly differentiated that had only one mutation, only one uh, NRAS mutation. Here's a case of medullary with no RET mutation, but with a RAS mutation uh, and, a, a, and with a KRAS mutation. Uh, interestingly, it was seen on cytology as Bethesda 6, so uh, they still sent for mutational analysis. And anyway, so one medullary thyroid cancer. Uh, here is just looking at size and age of the patients and gender. Most of the patients in this trial were women with a few men. I think that's all. Well, we can glean from this slide. There's a few interesting cases. Most cases were benign. A few a follicular variant thyroid, uh, papillary thyroid cancer. Uh, interesting, there were no cases of follicular thyroid cancer out of these 80 patients that they saw, or at least out of the 56 who had surgery. Um, here again uh, is a breakdown of the specific mutation. Most of the time, it's this Q61R in the various uh, isoforms of RAS, but with a handful of these other mutations. So here's the big question. Let's add it all up. How often does a RAS mutation predict thyroid cancer? Well, it depends if you count NIFTP as cancer or if you don't. And then they break it down by mutation, but there's really not enough in some of these categories. So I added it all up. There's 23 cases of cancer if you count NIFTP, leading to a 41% uh, prevalence rate of cancer in RAS mutation thyroid nodules. Uh, if you don't count NIFTP as cancer, of course, the number is lower. 29%. So it's a pretty low level, but of course not zero. Um, and then, you know, most of these reflect what's happening in this Q61R mutation ice, uh, variant. These other variants really aren't enough. There's seven and three. So it's hard to know if these numbers will play out if there have were larger, larger numbers in the study. Another question is, how do these specific variants, mutation in the specific isoforms of RAS, do they confer any differences in risk of cancer? And again, there's probably not enough to make a good conclusion. If you eyeball it, it looks very similar. Again, this is if you count NIFTP as cancer. Uh, all of these are around 41%, uh, whether it's HRAS, KRAS, or NRAS. There's only eight cases, you know, so it's really hard to conclude if this is, you know, this number may, may be modified in a larger series. Um, if you don't count NIFTP as cancer, similar around 29% in most instances. Um, and uh, interesting, you know, uh, well, that there was cancer seen in this other, you know, mutation, this Q61K, and there was at least a NIFTP in this G12R mutation. So there are cancers that can form, or at least precancerous lesions, doesn't just have to be the Q61R mutation of RAS to cause cancer. Um, as I mentioned, they included cytology that maybe you or I wouldn't in a mutational analysis. For example, they had Bethesda 1 and Bethesda 2, essentially negative cytology. And so if you take those and just look at that, you know, uh, uh, those who had RAS mutations who then went for surgery, only one of the six who went for surgery had cancer, follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. The rest uh, did not seem, although some of the pathology was uncertain. And one that was biopsied was less than six millimeters. Here's another four less than six millimeters. So maybe they didn't always follow the ATA guidelines, but this is a real world scenario. Often we do the same thing. Um, so that's if it was negative cytology. If it was malignant cytology, there were four that had malignant cytology that they sent, and three of them had surgery, and all three had cancer, including the medullary, including one of the poorly differentiated thyroid cancers that was seen, and then one follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. Another person opted not for surgery and is just doing follow-up, and so far is stable, but as you can see, there's not much follow-up yet. It's only a few months. Um, I think this one was 18 months. I have to we'll, we'll look, but it's a small follow-up. This is the group here that we may typically send for molecular testing. This is the Bethesda 3, 4, and 5 cytology. And even in that group, the predictive value of a RAS mutation is not very high. Uh, again, it matters if you count NIFTP as cancer or not, of course. Uh, and whether it's Bethesda 3, you know, if you don't count NIFTP, there is only 15% cases with cancer, only 5 out of 32. Um, if you, Bethesda 4, if you don't count 
NIFTP, only one out of eight, so a really kind of low percent, but also kind of low numbers. Need a need a bigger sample size, really. Uh, Bethesda five was uh, with the presence of a RAS mutation was much higher predictable of being cancer. But what type of cancers? Well, these are the cancers. Eight of them were follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. Three of them were papillary thyroid cancer, and one of them was this poorly differentiated thyroid cancer that I had showed you earlier on that kind of rainbow plot. Um, so there's some cancer, there's some NIFTP, but there's also a lot of benign uh, thyroid nodules, follicular adenomas that are seen uh, in patients who have RAS mutations. This is a busy slide, uh, and it's intentionally busy. You know, this is, they tried to look, they tried to use their own data here to validate the ThyroSeq test. Uh, this has been done before, of course, but now this is the Boston data. And the numbers here are probably not as good as what Mickey Furov publishes. But again, this is ThyroSeq version 2, not version 3 for the most part. Uh, and perhaps there'd be some improvement on version 3 that there usually is seen in Mickey Furov's data as well. Um, but they did it by, you know, this is all of the analyses subtracting out the very low risk mutations. So any type of cytology. Uh, was involved was in, in shown here, and it had a sensitivity. If you count NIFTP as cancer here, of 57, per, uh, excuse me, of 76 percent, and a specificity of 58 percent. You know, predictive values, you know, a little bit lower. Um, if you just look at the Bethesda 3, 4, 5, uh, sensitivity and specificity get better. Um, and then, as we do, we don't even, you know, in my practice, I often do not send the Bethesda 5. Uh, from mutational analysis, and that's not where you're supposed to, you, you know, the, uh, the published studies just look at Bethesda 3 and 4 for the most part, though some do look at Bethesda 5. Um, if you look at just those, uh, there's a little bit better sensitivity. Specificity is um, still rather low, and so you can see the numbers here are a little bit lower than what Nikki Furov put, uh, puts forth, but as I said, this is ThyroSeq version 2. We're using version 3, and I think uh, we know that the uh, uh, the sensitivities are probably better than this, and the specificities are a little bit better than this in the version three. Um, the next, next question they ask is, is are there any correlations with the radiology appearance of the nodule, the TIRAS score? And so first they looked at whether it's a KRAS, HRAS, or NRAS mutation, and here's the TIRAS score, the actual score. Here is the, the number or percentage of TIRAS greater than three. And in the KRAS group, there's only 10. Um, but eight of them had a high TIRAS score. So this one is statistically different. Um, so you might say that KRAS maybe makes a change in the ultrasonography appearance, but really this is such a small amount. I'm not sure if you can really conclude that. It's only 10 compared to 17 or 53. Um, I think more interesting is looking at whether it's benign, MIF-TP, or cancer, and looking at TIRAS scoring in each one and, you know, you know, I uh, just want to point this out. Anyone recognize this? 10, 17, 53. Uh, 10, 17, 53. That's a typo. Should have been in these numbers. Um, and so, uh, anyway, of the 33 benign cases, 20 at 12, about a third had a TIRAS score greater than 3, which is not statistically different than the 9 out of 18 cancers. So, the point of this is that TIRAS scoring in people with RAS mutations does not seem to predict cancer. And I think that's something that we've learned from this study. I think that's uh, rather important. So the case that we presented at the beginning of this go painstakingly describe the nodule as it should, but maybe those descriptions in a RAS mutation aren't that helpful in predicting clinical outcome. Uh, here's a, another bit of information, just looking at the seven cases with more than one mutation. The bottom four, uh, are NRAS mutations in addition to TERT-T mutations, and the bottom one has three mutations, TERT-T and this EIF1AX mutation. And here's what happened. Uh, one of them, as I said, did not have surgery, and so far after, it was six months. After six months, it's been stable in size. Uh, doesn't really tell you a whole lot about this cancer. Uh, there is this one here that had a poorly differentiated thyroid cancer, but seemed to do pretty well with uh, surgical resection, and then with radioiodine treatment, thyroid globulin went down from 4.2 down to 9.3. So, so far as having a good outcome, uh, but anyway, that's that's this case. Um, there's this one mutation, you might say right here, that was benign, 
this NRAS and EIF1AX, and we'll say, well, this is a patient that had two mutations. We would have expected to see surgery, but if you look very carefully, the allelic frequency of the NRAS was only 5%. It's usually much higher in many of the other specimens. The allelic frequency of this other mutation also is very low. And of course, it's only one case, so it's quite speculative, but perhaps this very low rate of mutation seen within the lesion uh, may explain why this was still benign. And maybe we should use this, of course, more study is needed to, to say that for sure, but we can at least look at allelic frequency and have some idea of how this might behave uh, clinically. The other, uh, other mutations were seen, uh, either were followed and are stable or a follicular variant, uh, papillary thyroid cancer, at least dual mutation cases. Um, the last thing uh, that they looked at was, you know, there are categories of genes uh, and how do they predict cancer? Uh, we have the RAS only category, the RAS like, the BRAF, V receptor, uh, V600E uh, uh, like mutations, the low risk mutation, high risk, and others. And they all behave as you would expect. The RAS only, as we talked about, has a low risk of cancer, a moderate risk of NIFTP, and a high rate of benign lesions. The RASC-like, if you remember, RASC-like is pretty much the same as RAS with these few others. And so it's these 73 plus eight more. So it's not surprising the numbers are about the same. Uh, the B, uh, BRAF V600E mutations in this study were all cancer. We know that that's not true in real life, but we do know that it is a, a uh, higher risk mutation. And it does confer in this study also higher risk than a RAS mutation. Um, the low risk mutations, uh, none of them in this study were cancer. Uh, we know that's not true in real life. Sometimes they do confer thyroid cancer, but in this study with only 12 patients, they didn't see any. The high risk combinations, all six that have had surgery uh, that they uh, looked at uh, were, were malignancies. So, uh, so that predicts cancer. And then these other alterations predict perhaps a little bit better than RAS cancer, but still not 100% predictive. So what is the strengths of the study? Well, this is a real world study. So it does kind of reflect the practice that we do. It does seem to have a lot of Bethesda ones and maybe maybe that is their local cytologist and they try to get around it by sending all these Bethesda ones for molecular studies. Uh, it's a real world study. It's a malign they really did meticulous tracking of data. I pointed out that one typo, but I mean, that's that's nothing. They did the calculations correct. Uh, they tracked a lot of data very meticulously and. Uh, re-evaluated the specimens for TIRAD scoring, uh, the imaging. Um, so, and there was, of course, a lot of expertise coming out of this thyroid group out of Boston. Some of the limitations is that this is a small sample. Even though they had 1,400 patients that they enrolled, by the time they willed it down to just the RAS mutations, there were only 56 who went for surgery, which is hardly enough to make solid clinical recommendations about. But I think you get some idea of how RAS cancers behave or RAS uh, thyroid nodules behave. Uh, this is a single center. It would be nice to have multiple centers to see just how uh, translatable this kind of information is. Uh, another limitation is that they did include the Bethesda 1, 2, and 6, uh, although they did separate it out in various analyses and had similar results, they did include them and that does skew the data a little bit. And the last, I think, limitation is the very, very short follow-up. I mean, this is not enough for thyroid cancer. You need at least you know, at least five, 10, 20 years. I mean, you know, of course, none of us can wait around that long. We'd love to see the data now. So we need longer follow-up. What can we conclude? Well, we can conclude that RAS mutations are the most frequent mutations that are found in Bethesda 3, 4, and 5 cytology nodules. We can conclude that the TIRAD scoring system, at least in this study, uh, did not add predictive value in patients who had RAS mutations in their thyroid nodule. In thyroid nodules that had RAS mutations, 29% are cancer, and 71%, including the NIFTPs, are not cancer. Now, that's one way of saying it. Another way of saying it is recognizing the dynamics of thyroid nodules. So you could say are not cancer now, not cancer yet. But you could say it either way, both would be correct. Both have different implications. And when you say that to a patient, you can actually direct what they wanna do. And we have a lot of influence over what our patients might choose. Uh, a few more conclusions. Most neoplasms resulting from RAS are either NIFTP or follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer. Both of these have a very favorable prognosis and most of the time can be treated either by active surveillance 
or lobectomy, uh, and patients would do very well. However, two of the neoplasms were seen were medullary thyroid cancer and poorly differentiated thyroid cancer with only a RAS mutation, so 9%. Um, that's a little bit high. That makes us all, you know, should give us all a little bit of pause, uh, and we need to be sure that we talk to patients before deciding what the clinical course will be, uh, that we may actually find one of these other rare instances. Most of the time it's an FTP and a follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, but sometimes it's not. There's a few more things we should consider when looking at this study, just about thyroid cancer biology. I showed you this already. This was the 500 case study where they did whole genome analysis of thyroid cancers, of papillary thyroid cancers, and they saw mostly BRAF mutations. If you look at the very top, because it's whole genome analysis, not next-gen testing, which is what we get, um, they can tell you how many mutations were seen per million base pairs in the genome of the cancers. And it's a bit variable, some were very high, but on average it's about 0.5 to 1 per million base pairs. This is less than many other cancers, which is perhaps why thyroid cancer is not, not as aggressive as other cancers most of the time. We don't get this information when we, uh, when we do biopsies, but it might, you know, it certainly could explain why uh, there are, you know, many, many other mutations. There's, there's a, a, you know, 3.2 billion base pairs in the human genome. So this confers if it's about, a, if it's about one per million, that's 3,000 other mutations. Most of those mutations are in junk DNA, in introns, perhaps they're not clinically significant, but some of them are. And that may explain exactly why sometimes BRAF will form a classic PTC, and maybe sometimes why it forms a tall cell PTC, and maybe why some of the differences here are seen in the histology uh, of the specimens with RAS mutations. And of course, they do see these other mutations because there are so many mutations in cancer. That's part of cancer biology that new, new mutations form. So when you do a specimen and you look just at next-gen testing and find a single gene, just keep in mind that there are many other genes that have been mutated, and we don't have information about that. Um, the second thing is just how, to, how cancers progress. This is kind of in theory, but of course there's a, a cell with a mutation that then tends to grow and then can metastasize. That's one theory. Another model is a cell mutates, grows, and then mutates some more. That kind of goes along with this, uh, you know, 3,000 other mutations seen in cancer, um, and then eventually metastasizes. Or a cell mutates, grows, metastasizes, and then at the metastasis mutates more. And in both of these last two scenarios, for example, if you just biopsy the left side of this lesion, you'll be missing mutations that are here. Or if you just biopsy this lesion, you'll be missing these mutations here, and you'll have a tough time predicting just based on the few mutations or one mutation that you found. Does that happen in thyroid cancer? You bet it does. This is a study looking at 185 thyroid cancers, 164 with lymph node metastases, 56 with distant metastases, and they analyze tissue from each one just for three genes. So this is not whole genome, just three genes, TERT-T, BRAF, and NRAS mutations. And here's all the differentiated thyroid cancers. Uh, it's hard to tell you know, which is which consistently, but if you look just at the NRAS, there was only three NRAS seen. This is uh, mostly papillary thyroid cancer. You know, here it is, 166 papillary thyroid cancer. Three NRAS seen in the primary lesion, but if you look at the distant metastases, there are five, so two new NRAS mutations here. What other genes are mutated? Don't know. The TERT-T in this category, interestingly, there were 21 here. If you look at the lymph nodes, there were only 16. Now, sure, there's only 153 in the denominator for 163. Still, most metastasized to lymph nodes. How can you explain this? Well, must be that the TERT-T mutated in some cases after this mutation, uh, after this cell metastasized to the lymph node. So the mutation stayed in the primary lesion, but didn't make it to the lymph node. Um, similar things were seen in the follicular cancer um, or in this poorly differentiated cancer. Here's BRAF. Uh, you see one here, uh, none here, and one here. Uh, here's TERT again, two in the primary lesion, four in the distant metastasis. So we're seeing new mutations in various regions of thyroid cancer. Here's a case, uh, I've included this uh, just because they sampled various sites within the same lesion. 
So this is a 71-year-old male who had papillary thyroid cancer with, uh, 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 in the right thyroid. Uh, at presentation, he had pulmonary and lymph node metastases. He had total thyroidectomy and two treatments with radiation. He had worsening of his pulmonary, you know, he had a partial response, but then worsening of uh, pulmonary metastases. And so they did a biopsy. They did, of course, thyroidectomy. Uh, they did a biopsy of the uh, pulmonary metastases. And then a little, li little bit later, they did two biopsies of lymph nodes. And each lymph node was sectioned into two sections. So we have, you know, two from lymph node one and two from lymph node two for these were, sorry, not biopsies. These were uh, excisions of lymph nodes, and they were sectioned and uh, had mutational analysis from each one of these sample sites compared to their normal thyroid, which you can see right here. And here are the mutations. I know it's very busy, but just to see, look at that. It's an NRAS mutation uh, with a Q61R, just like we always see most of the time, not always. Um, and here's the allelic frequencies, which stayed the same, started to drop off in the pleural lesion. Um, here's this other gene. I'm not quite sure this gene, but just to show you, the allelic frequency uh, is here in the primary tumor, but a little bit lower, about half almost, in this other section of the primary tumor and not present in any of the other sites. And then here, these are other genes that are not seen in the primary tumor, but sometimes seen in lymph nodes at different frequencies in different sites. Um, and sometimes seen, but not seen in the pleural metastasis for this one, and then sometimes not seen in the lymph nodes, but are seen in the pleural metastasis. So in other words, if you have a biopsy of a primary lesion that doesn't necessarily tell you all of the genetic material that's going on with distant lesions that may be present. So a few more questions I had. Well, the obvious question I think we all have, what happens to the people who opted for active surveillance rather than uh, surgery with their RAS mutation in a thyroid nodule. We'd love to see greater follow-up than 18 months. And of course, um, these are only 16 patients. We really need 100 patients or even great, greater than that, hundreds of patients to have a, any kind of meaningful prediction and reassurance. Uh, but still, it's nice to have 16 patients and over longer periods of time, it'd be interesting to see what happens with RAS mutations. Uh, in, you know, that are naturally left in place and see how often they grow or change. Um, another observation that we all should have taken is that BRAS mutations are the most common mutation in these uh, Bethesda 3, 4, and 5 nodules. On the other hand, BRAF mutations are the highest mutation seen in, di in differentiated thyroid cancer. So, this is kind of a cross-sectional moment in time when you do surgery um, and or a biopsy. And we use this to infer the rate of malignant potential, we call this, or rate of progression from normal tissue to adenoma to NIFTP to cancer. Uh, we, can we use that to infer that it's much slower in RAS? I think certainly that we can. Um, can we use this to calculate how much slower? Well, this study is not quite large enough, but a larger study you could, because of course, if you take a cross-sectional study, you'll be sampling, uh, and, and if you see these transition stages, you can use the amount of transition stages uh, to kind of uh, estimate the kinetics from normal to malignancy, uh, which we seem to see is lower in RAS. It'd be great to give a number uh, rather than just a percentage of cancer, but just a rate of change would be interesting uh, compared to say BRAF or some other combination of mutations would be interesting. Um, would the results be different if they use ThyroSeq version three? Probably, I bet you there would be some more two mutation specimens that would be seen and that might help guide management a little bit better. Alas, they used version two. So we'll wait for the next study, I suppose. Um, and then the last thing, which we didn't really talk about very much here, but we know microRNA uh, is an important signal molecule, both paracrine and even as kind of a hormone-like molecule secreted by many cells, including normal thyroid cells. And then when thyroid cells transform into cancer, they secrete different microRNAs. They generate and secrete different ones. Um, this perhaps is important in their own tumor biology. Certainly, it can be used to predict cancer versus not, but there's only one platform available these days for microRNA. And if you send a specimen to them and they find a RAS mutation, they stop, you know, to save money. They don't send the microRNA panel. I suppose they would if you asked them. It would be interesting to know what the microRNA panel is with a mutation like RAS because that might help guide management 
Of course, we need studies to back that up, but that's an interesting question I think that's been generated. Can't we get some more uh, molecular information to help guide with RAS, especially since the TIRAD scoring doesn't seem to be a good guide in, the, in most cases. Um, in addition to my commentary, Dr. Yip, has put forth, a, uh, from the University of Pittsburgh, has put forth a, a very nice commentary in the same journal, uh, the same issue of thyroid. And he raised uh, these six points. Uh, one, that this is a you know nice study. It's a real world study, a little bit retrospective, of course. Any real world study, I suppose, would be because you have to review the records. Uh, but he does point out, just like we said, that the size of the study is too small. I mean, even with 1,400 patients, not enough. We really need a multi-center trial to generate enough data so we can predict and alter our clinical course. They should do a cost analysis. Of course, they've already done cost analyses, just looking at these kind of molecular studies compared to surgery, uh, when we try to uh, avoid surgery in every patient with Bethesda 3 or Bethesda 4. Um, that's great cost analysis. Now that we're using the same molecular panel to uh, guide our post-operative management of cost analysis of that should be done, that makes sense. Um, TIRAD scoring, as we observed, was not correlated with malignancy. And he pointed out that the TIRAD system really was designed for thyroid cancer, all thyroid cancer, which is the majority of which is papillary thyroid cancer. And that may appear a little bit different on ultrasound and may correspond better to uh, you know, the TIRAD scores. Uh, and of course, with the RAS mutations, we see follicular thyroid cancer, although they didn't see it in the study. And we see follicular variant thyroid cancer, papillary thyroid cancer, which in, at least in this study did not correlate. Uh, maybe when you have a RAS mutation, we shouldn't be using the ultrasound images unless there's something overt like lymph nodes, et cetera. Uh, if it's just the run of the mill, you know, taller than wide or irregular border, something like that, maybe that doesn't guide. Uh, management uh, in patients who have RAS. But of course, this is only one small study. We'd love to, to verify that. Uh, the la of last two points, one is that lobectomy is preferred because of the high rate of NIFTP or follicular variant papillary thyroid cancer, both of which have excellent prognoses. So either lobectomy as the surgery or active surveillance could be done. But we do need better predictors, right? I mean, several of the RAS-only cancers were poorly differentiated thyroid cancer or medullary thyroid cancer. And these are things we don't want to miss, or at least we want to prepare the patient that is possible. And uh, so we shouldn't be surprised to see this sometimes when we're using RAS to guide surgical management. Be prepared that we might see one of these types of cancers with a much poorer prognosis. And that's the end of my uh, talk. Um, I think Dr. Terry Davies has a few more comments. And at the end, we'll review um, the, uh, the case and take a poll again. So thank you for paying attention and I'll pass this on to Dr. Davies. Morning everyone. Um, thank you, Michael. That was a tour de force doesn't leave me a lot of time to talk, but I do have a few things to say. Um, the first is that a journal club, which uh, is an important part of our experience, should not leave us confused. Right? So um, I've split my comments into two types. One is a general overview, where we are with thyroid nodules, and then just a little bit of history on, on the RAS gene much of which uh, Michael has covered, but I have a couple of points uh, to make. Um, so I divided this into five ways, something easy to remember. There are five different ways of approaching um, a thyroid nodule. And in my view, the old way is the best. And that is that the only definitive diagnosis of a thyroid nodule is by surgery. Now, this is okay if you are, um, uh, uh, at least in the old days, if you were wealthy, you had high quality medical care and you found a lump in your thyroid, you had it out. But of course, two thirds of the population have thyroid nodules. So our job uh, these days is to try and sort out which ones to take out. So the second way is the Bethesda way, 
and we've got some of my favorite apologists on the line. So I want to be careful what I say, but I will um, say that so testing by Bethesda leaves you with 20% failure rate uh, looking down the microscope because they're indeterminate, indeterminate. Even benign cytology has a risk, and we'll come back to that. But this quote that I've put here just points out that when you ask different pathologists to look down the same slide, you're only going to get about 60 to 75% um, concordance. So that pathology in itself um, has serious issues uh, that need to be addressed. And that's what the Bethesda um, system was meant to, to, uh, to correct. But in my view, it's failed. And I also have a philosophical problem as to why uh, a particular cancer biology should have a consistent geography. Now, of course, it may have a common geography, but it's not going to be necessarily 100% consistent. And so um, that, that also is a fundamental problem with the concept of trying to recognize cancer histologically. Then, of course, we've got the imaging way. And, you know, thyroidologists love this. They love to, um, to do scans and ultrasounds, and it's very uh, rare for it to be really useful in a patient. Yes, you're going to get some obvious cancer uh, under the ultrasound, but the vast majority of patients who we are ultrasound, time after time, year after year, uh, is mostly a waste of time. The, the testing has low sensitivity, and I'm not going to discuss it further today, although Michael Via did touch on some of it. The fourth way is the molecular way, which we've been stressing this morning. So what can we say about that? Well, the fact that there are multiple commercial systems available now indicates to me that not one of them is particularly outstanding. Otherwise, they would take over the market. And ThyroSeq, which seems to be very popular, um, I'm quoting here uh, that yeah, I'm quoting here because I can't see my quote. I'm trying to get the screen to show me my quote. Um, that uh, ThyroSeq may obviate diagnostic surgery in 60% of patients with uh, Bethesda 3 and 4. Now, that's a 40% error in the testing, right? And even with the indeterminate cytology and benign, uh, so-called benign uh, molecular analysis, you've got an 18 or 20% error. So there's a positive uh, predictive value as uh, Michael Via went over is only around 60%. That's appalling. As a, as a test, would you do a CT scan looking for a brain tumor if you knew it was only 60% positive uh, accurate? Well, you might if you came up with a positive review, right, and a positive piece of information, but uh, 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 you're going to miss 40% of brain tumors. And then five is um, the math way. And that's the most difficult, I think, for all of us. And that's at what level of risk can you make an appropriate decision to avoid surgery? I remember, surgery is 100% accurate, right? It has error, you know, it has problems in certain patients and with certain surgeons, but the pathology at least is 100% accurate, I think. Um, but everything we do has a risk. Young people see risk differently, obviously, or else we wouldn't have a war, right? Um, nobody would go out to the war. They knew the risk of being killed. See, that was much more prevalent as a problem in the older days when everyone was likely to die. 
So why do we consider anything? Why do we consider all these tests that have limited sensitivity and specificity? And maybe there'll be some discussion if not today. Now, lastly, I just wanted to talk a little bit about RAS. Um, um, Dr. Via surveyed RAS beautifully in his presentation, right? But um, RAS, first of all, is, is named after a rat sarcoma forming gene. And that was at the time when many of these oncogenes were recognized uh, as um, similar to virus uh, initiating. Um, uh, it doesn't mean that RAS is initiated by a virus. It just means that the mutations that we see are similar to uh, what is seen in these viruses. So RAS is a membrane-associated GTP binding protein. It sits on the membrane, um, and it's activated, as you saw earlier, in the signal transduction pathway um, by the EGF receptor kinase initiating primarily MAFK kinase testing. So when overexpressed, um, the RAS gene can transform cells. Right? And it comes, as you heard, in three different forms. And the H and the K and the N are named after different um, identification systems. A couple of them after, uh, I think, uh, viruses. And, and the N RAS is named after the neuroblastoma RAS. Now, the way it works, the way, the way it becomes an initiating oncogene is that the mutation, and obviously there are various mutations that have different effects, but they become insensitive to being destroyed by what's called an activating protein or a GAP, a, a, a GTP uh, activating protein that hydrolyzes uh, RAS. Um, and so, if RAS isn't hydrolyzed, it accumulates on the membrane, and therefore you have a high expression level of RAS <clears throat> that is able to induce right, proliferation and malignancy. And this dates back now from 1982 when RAS was first found, um, mutated particularly, and still today particularly, in lung, colon, and pancreas. So in those um, uh, cancers, the presence of RAS is a really uh, terrible prognosis. They also found that RAS can be mutated in the germline, right? rather than a somatic mutation, which we are always talking about in thyroid cancers and nodules. RAS mutations can occur in germline genes, but they, uh, the so-called RASopathies, they tend to be associated with childhood abnormal syndromes, just to which you're not very nice. But I think one point that um, <clears throat> Michael didn't mention, um, and that is we have no anti-RAS therapy. So even if RAS was an important gene for thyroid cancer, um, we, we, we have great difficulty uh, inhibiting it. And that's true in lung, colon, and pancreas also. So uh, the other point that he made that I think was very helpful was that cancer development occurs with a combination of genes. Right? And some people call the important genes part of a gene mountain, where there's a small common set of mutations. The RAS would be a mountain gene in thyroid. Uh, and maybe um, RAS is, could be one, but it doesn't seem to be. Right? The RAS seems to be more, uh, more of one of the uh, genes in a gene hill which are the many other gene mutations. But RAS is so common, I think if we were dividing things together, we would put BRAF and RAS together in, in, in the mountain. But RAS clearly, from the data you've heard this morning, is not a major cancer-causing gene in, in thyroid. I mean, um, there are a large number uh, without, without uh, involvement. So 
problem is that RAS mutations occur in both benign and malignant thyroid mutations. And in the tumors where RAS is important, it's the KRAS, which appears to be the most dangerous, <clears throat> and that's the rarest in the thyroid cancers, as you saw in this paper. Um, in general, they only eight to 10% um, uh, are KRAS. <clears throat> But they're very common, and they're very common in indeterminate samples. And so they can't be highly malignant in the thyroid cell, right? They can be contributing. Um, and clearly, we need to know a, a great deal more because only about 30% of uh, samples, right, have a detected mutation um, at fine needle aspiration. So something is making even benign nodules grow. Something is making cancers grow that are not detected in 70% of cancers. So even mutational analysis is at a very primitive stage uh, of development. And I think I put on the slide here, the paper under discussion only had eight or 10 nodules with KRAS. The malignancy rate was similar for all three isoforms indicating the RAS is a poor predictor of malignancy when acting alone, and they are not mountain genes. So I think on reflection, you're going to have to include them in the mountain, but they're not on the top of the heap. Um, why, should this be? why should RAS expression in a, um, in, in a colon cancer be very malign uh, malignant, give a bad prognosis? And, and it doesn't seem to do that in the thyroid. And clearly the feedback loop for the express RAS is not as clearly malignancy oriented as in other cells. Um, but at, at this point, as far as I know, and that has not been explored so far. Um, and that's uh, it. So thank you. Um, I think we go back now to the case presentation. Great. Terry and Michael, thank you. Um, that was absolutely terrific. Um, we've gone over just a little bit and I'm sure people are starting their day. Maybe if we could just put the poll up um, and have people register their votes um, just to see if we've influenced anyone today in terms of um, how to manage this particular patient. And I apologize to some folks who um, put in some questions that uh, we're not able to uh, to get to those questions at this time. This was an amazing discussion by both um, Dr. Villa and Dr. Davies, so thank you. Um, thank everybody for joining us. Um, I'll give just another few seconds here to get the uh, poll up, and um, just wanna put in an invitation to everybody to join us again next week. Um, we will be publishing our schedule for the rest of the um, next three months. Um, we are working a quarter at a time here, um, and so we will be able to give you some inside information as to what to expect uh, with respect to um, upcoming uh, journal clubs. It looks to me like we did have a significant impact on um, individuals who uh, registered and uh, recorded their um, poll um, selections for the um, uh, from before and afterwards. And so I think as uh, one would judge the success of a um, journal club, it looks like we have had an impact on the way people are visualized or are thinking about RAS mutant um, thyroid nodules. So with that, thank you everyone. Uh, Dr. Davies and Dr. Um, Via, thank you once again. That was amazing uh, presentation. So thank you. Great, thank you for having us. Thank you. You bet. Everybody stay safe.